Now we are gonna have uh, Katrina and Matthias uh, talking about auto SQL. No, auto SQL learn. Sorry if I mispronounce. Really good one. His name. Uh, automated machine learning in Python. Hello, people. How are you? Hi. Good. Thanks. Where are you streaming from? Uh, Freiburg in Germany. Oh, nice. And how's the weather over there? Pretty warm. It's oh, really? too hot outside. And is it uh, sunny? Yes, very oh, sunny. Oh, you're lucky. I'm here <laughs> in the Netherlands and it's uh, warm but uh, super cloudy. <laughs> well, okay. it might change next hour. Let's hope so. Uh, so if you are ready, we are going to start with uh, Katharina, right? Yes, exactly. OK. Thanks. Yeah, welcome. And also, thanks for the kind introduction. And it's my pleasure to have a talk here at EuroPython on AutoML in Python and present our open source tool, AutoSkillerun. So first of all, why are we doing this? Why do we need AutoML? Machine learning is a very important key technology being used in many applications already and will be used in many more. However, mastering the art of machine learning requires expertise and experience. AutoML democratizes machine learning and makes it available for everyone. Our vision is a bit more specific because we want to do this in four lines of code. So these four lines perfectly summarize our session today. Import, auto-scale-learn, instantiate, fit, predict, done. Our goals for today are we want you we want you to get excited about automated machine learning to see what has been achieved and what could be possible in the future. Also, we want you to understand how AutoSQLearn works such that you can apply it to your own applications. We're going to split the session in two parts. First, I'll tell you about AutoSQLearn and how it evolved over the past years, and then Matthias will give you a short demo session. And we'll have two Q&A slots, one after my part and one after Matthias' part. So then, let's start. Uh, let's assume you have some data and plan to use scikit-learn for that. You read through the docs and stumble across this cheat sheet. It describes a huge decision tree compiling many rules of thumb of when to use which algorithm. This is awesome. I do like this cheat sheet. You follow a path and end up with a model to use. While this is a good starting point, there are many more decisions to be made in order to find the best performing model. And wouldn't it be great if there would be something that automatically does these for you? Before I'll tell you how we do this in AutoSQ Learn, let's have a closer look at, this, at the design space, uh, space we search. So I said, assume you have data. So now we assume you have X train and Y train, so your data and labels. You might also do have a test set for which you don't know the labels yet. You do have a budget, which are the compute resources you're willing to spend on solving this problem. And there is a loss function that describes the performance measure you're interested in, like accuracy or error or AUC. Um, then the machine learning pipeline, um, for us, that's a pipeline that consists of a data preprocessor, such as outlier detection or imputing missing values, then a feature preprocessor um, that does dimensionality reduction or adds new features, followed by a classifier that does the actual predictions. So more concretely, this is what it looks like for scikit-learn. For each of these steps in the pipeline, you have a lot of choices. And not only you need to select an algorithm, you also need to select the hyperparameters for each algorithm. So in total, there are over 150 hyperparameters and growing, which can be set in order to construct a pipeline. So the question is, how do we find the best configuration in that space? And the answer to this is black box optimization. It's called black box because we have no idea, we don't have any gradients, and we assume we don't know anything that helps us to find the best configuration. So really, the only mode of interaction is querying it with an X, which is the configuration of a machine learning pipeline, and observe f of X, which is the performance of that pipeline. And since time and resources are finite, 
we want to execute this loop as few times as possible and we want to select the axis to evaluate in a smart way. The most obvious way could be a human optimizer, also called grad student descent. That comes with the advantage that you'll learn a lot about your system. And it's probably not very efficient and error prone and you really need expert knowledge or a lot of time. Slightly better would be grid search. It's a very simple approach. You just retrace your dimensions, evaluate each grid point. This can be done in parallel and you can also use it to study your problem. However, it does not scale to high dimensions and the grid needs to be defined. Even better, random search. Even simpler and still easy to parallelize, eventually also converges to the optimum. It's still not very data efficient and thus computationally expensive. So what else is there? There is Bayesian optimization. That um, is the state of the art and is a very data efficient search um, procedure. It trades off exploration, meaning it explores areas of the design space that it has not seen and it exploits areas of the design space that it believes to be promising. Also on the, on the um, drawback side, while well, we used to say it does not scale with parallel resources, there are also solutions for that. And that's what we do, we use Bayesian optimization. Combining this with our pipeline, we already get a very vanilla version of Autodesk Learn. While this works, it's not very efficient and we added many things to speed it up. First of all, the, the first thing we did was adding meta learning. We have a lot of data obtained on previous experiments because we run it over and over again on data sets and we want to reuse that experience. So such that for a new data set, we don't have to start from scratch. Concretely, we collected a lot of data sets, search for a good configuration on each of these. And for a new data set, we compute the distance of this data set to the data sets in our database. And we start the optimization procedure by running the best performing configurations on these data sets. So we warm start Bayesian optimization. The second thing is that we figured that simply returning only the best model is a waste of kind of a waste of resources. And it's well known that a team of models performs much better. So we construct ensembles to get the most out of it. And combining this then, um, that's the first version of Autodesk Learn. It works nicely and defined the state of the art in 2015 by winning several prizes in competitions. However, times have changed, data sets grew larger and Autodesk Learn needed to scale. We discovered two shortcomings. A, meta features are quite expensive or can be expensive. So we need that to compute the nearest data sets for warm starting. And Secondly, B, that large data sets can be an issue since it can be too expensive to evaluate even a single model. I describe our approach to tackle these in the following. The first change we did was um, getting rid of the meta features and the k-nearest data sets. Instead of computing the initial configurations from scratch for a new data set, we went with a portfolio. This means for every run of orders learn, we executed the same set of pipelines. And for this, it's very important that the set is diverse and covers as many use cases as possible. Um, so for that, we use a greedy algorithm to compute the portfolio. Assuming on the right, you can see that we have a large set of candidate configuration. That's the x-axis C0s to C4. And we have some data sets D0 to D5. Um, we start adding to our portfolio configuration two. That's the one in the middle because it has the best average performance. It's not really good on any data set, but also not bad. The next addition to our portfolio would be configuration zero because it really performs well on data set one to three. And then we would add configuration four, which performs well on the four and the five. So these three configurations cover all data sets in the database and would be a good diverse portfolio to warm start optimization. Having solved that, we took care of large data sets. For that, we rely on successive halving, 
which recently gained a lot of attention. Successive halving itself is a pretty simple concept. If you have an iterative algorithm like gradient boosting on your networks, you can get a good estimate of the final performance after only a few iterations. This also works for data subsets when you evaluate the algorithm on a smaller subset of the full data set. Successive halving exploits this by allocating more resources to promising configurations. How does this work in detail? You have a few configurations and you evaluate all of them on the lowest budget. Then you drop half of them. Those are the lines that do not continue. You double the budget and evaluate the remaining configurations. Then you drop again half of them and so on. Of course, you don't need to half. You could also only keep a third and then triple the budget, but that's the basic idea. Um, you do this until only the best configuration survived. And by that, you can evaluate much more configurations than if you would evaluate all of them on the full budget. But what about small data sets? We want an AutumnL system that works on all um, data sets, on large ones and on small ones. On small ones, we probably don't want to use successive halving, but rather evaluate everything on the full budget and maybe use cross-validation. So let's have a look how these um, decisions impact the performance. So what we have here are results from running our tool with different optimization strategies. There is um, on the left-hand side of the plot, so all of this is balanced error rate, um, lower is better. On the left-hand side, you have full budget evaluations, um, runs that use full the full budget. On the right-hand side, you have um, runs that use successive halving. So on this data set, we probably want to use successive halving and hold out. But on another data set, exactly that policy performs very bad. And we would rather want to use full budget and tenfold cross-validation. Also, if you compare different time horizons, so on the bottom left, we um, run the system for 10 minutes and 60 minutes on the bottom right. So on the left-hand side, we would want to use holdout, but if we run for longer, cross-validation would have been a better choice. So the conclusion for this is, is, is it depends on the data set. So did we make it worse? Autumn Elm aims at making the application of machine learning easier. And now I told you that there are even more hyperparameters. So did we solve one problem and created a few more? And can we automatically select the, the optimization policy? That's what we covered in our latest research. And the short answer is yes, that's possible. We can do this with a learn selector. And for more details, I am um, refer to our latest work while I will now jump to a comparison. Um, so we had in the beginning, I told you about Order Scalon 1.0, which uses holdout, evaluates everything on the full budget and uses the nearest data sets. Now we have um, Order Scalon 2, which uses the selector and portfolios um, to um, warm start optimization. And here are um, some results from our work. Um, we show the average balanced regret across 39 data sets from the AutoML benchmark for two time horizons, for 10 minutes and for 60 minutes. Uh, we can observe the following. The longer you run um, the tool, the better it gets. And also um, the second um, Autos color 2.0 is significantly better because it achieves a lower regret. Yay. Uh, you'll also see more numbers in Matthias' part. And um, let's now move on to the conclusion and let me briefly talk about the success stories of Autoscalern. The first version of Autoscalern was built in 2015 to participate in the first AutoML challenge. For this um, challenge, participants had to submit software that runs without human interaction and produces predictions for unseen data sets. So the ideal AutoML setting. Our small site project evolved to a fully grown project and we spent many nights on making our submission robust and efficient. The effort paid off and in the end, Autos Cullen dominated the challenge by winning a substantial amount of pri prizes. For the next two years or so, we did some further research and maintenance. And then in 2018, we participated in the second Autumn L challenge 
for which we had to scale and um, why, that's why we introduced successive halving and portfolios. And again, one. Um, a nice intermediate milestone for us was in 2020 when we opened um, the 1000 pull request and had more than 5k stargazers on GitHub. And finally, earlier this year, we released Autos Cologne 2.0 as a first step towards truly hands-free AutoML. And this also brings me to our current team putting effort into this, who are Matthias, uh, me, and Eddie working on the code, but also Marius and Fra Frank providing new ideas and feedback. And most importantly, since this is open source, there are many other com contributors, maybe you, uh, providing bug, bug reports and fixes. Thanks a lot for that. And that concludes my part. I talked about Autos Cologne and AutoML in four lines of code. It's built on scikit-learn and our latest research. It's open source and you're welcome to try it yourself. And now I'd say we take some questions if there are some questions. Otherwise, I'd hand over to Matthias and we'll have another larger Q&A at the end. Okay, yeah, we have some questions. Let's see. We've got a last minute. Um, the first one is What are the pros and cons of Bayesian optimization using auto scale learn with respect to evolutionary algorithms like the one used in the library Tpot? Shall I take that, Katarina? Sure. Yeah. Um, so the difference there is um, the way it searches. Um, so Bayesian optimization uses another machine learning model in order to guide the search, while the evolutionary algorithm actually um, has a population of solutions and evolves them over time. Um, the evolutionary algorithm used by Tipol is actually a very special one, as it can handle um, basically an infinite space of possible machine learning pipelines. That has the advantage that, well, you can have really, really nice solutions that are out there, but also it, it really doesn't really scale that well. There is um, an, an open source AutoML benchmark out there where both are compared. And at least like the runs we did recently ourselves, we fare a bit better than Teapot. Okay, the next one is quite a long one. Uh, can you please briefly explain the idea of meta learning that is applied to for meta features given new data set? How is it possible to get relevant nearest data set using meta learning? We take the two? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Uh, so the idea here is to describe a data set by meta features. So meta because we are on the meta level. And these features describe the properties of the data set, such as how large is it? Like how many features does it have? How many classes does it have? How many missing values does it have, et cetera, et cetera. We then have a feature description of the new data set. We can use something like the L1 distance to, um, to, to have a space or also Euclidean space, doesn't matter. But then we basically have a space of data sets. And we, if we map a new data set in that space, we can compute the distance to all the neighbors and figure out which one is closest. Then we take the closest ones, look in the meta base, uh, what performed best on them, put these in a list, and run those, those things. Uh, just looking, is there anything else with respect to the question? You have two more questions. Yeah. Uh, if if you want, we can read one more and then you can continue. And then at the end, if we have more, uh, more time, you can finish. The, the, this one is a continuation of the previous one and says, are you collecting meta feature like uh, statistics, mean, standard deviation, data skewness in order to compare the data? I think the short answer is yes. Perfect. Among okay. others. Uh, well, now, if you want, you can continue. All right, then let's yeah. move ahead. Then see you in the second q &A. So, yes, let's now continue with uh, the demo session. Um, 
I will be using uh, two pattern notebooks. You can find them also on github.com slash autumnl slash auto dash sklearn dash talks. And yes, we are, um, yeah. As before, auto sklearn is a drop in replacement for um, scikit-learn and we'll demonstrate in this notebook briefly. Uh, I'll run you through installing AutoSQLearn, getting data, setting up a few baselines before actually then running AutoSQLearn. We will then have a look at what the tool did and inspect the model to see what uh, what things, which features are most important. So the first thing, I didn't execute the cell because I already had AutoSQLearn pre-installed, but it's as simple as pip install AutoSQLearn. It'll, it'll download package the dependencies um, for the dependencies we have built wheels so that you do not need a compiler on your local machine. Um, second step is then loading the data. For this, we'll be using a scikit-learn helper function, um, which is called fetch openml. We provide it with the dataset name. For this example, we'll use the demo dataset credit G, short for uh, German credit card dataset. We pass it the attribute as frame equals true so that we actually get a data frame. We also ask scikit-learn to return the x and y values directly instead of giving us an internal object of scikit-learn. And we then split into a train and a test set. Um, so this data set comes from OpenML. So OpenML is a platform for hosting machine learning uh, data sets and results. We can now go there and actually have a look what this data set looks like. Um, we can see here, or one of, the, one of the nice things it does for us actually is looking at like calculating statistics of the features and visualizing them. And we can see here the features of the data set, which are a total of 21. Most important for us is the feature class, which is actually the target that we aim to predict. Um, it is nominal, so it's a classification data set. It has two unique values. And these are good and bad. So whether it is a good request for credit or whether it's a bad request for credit, we don't want to give that person credit. We can see that the data is imbalanced. So there are 700 samples of good, while there are only 300 samples of bad. Besides that, um, this also tells us that um, a lot of the other features are nominal. Um, some of them are numerical, so we have mixed features. And if we scroll down further, we get further information about the data set, such that it's pretty small. So that's why I said example data set in the beginning. And uh, it has a zero missing values. So that makes our life a bit easier, actually, because we do not need to take care about that as well. Yes. Um, having had a look at the data set, um, I briefly want to mention if you, if you use data from somewhere else, you can also use your favorite pandas method to figure out what's in the data, for example, describe, or you can use a tool like pandas profiling, but um, that's not within the scope of this presentation. So we'll move on to actually doing some machine learning. So as a first step, we'll fit a model that is often used as, um, as a, a default or like, like, like first example model in a machine learning class, because it's really nice to explain a decision tree classifier. So here we import a decision tree classifier, we instantiate it without specifying any hyperparameters. So we just use it as scikit-learn gives it to it, provides it to us. We then um, have to do something about the categorical data because unfortunately scikit-learn doesn't like categorical data very much. It needs to be transformed into something it can handle. And what we do here is we use a so-called column transformer which applies individual transformers to certain subsets of the columns. In this case, we need to convert the, um, the categorical features into numerical ones. We can use, because we have a decision tree, we can use the ordinal encoder, which simply replaces the category by consecutive integers. Um, for the non-categorical, so for the numerical features, we can simply pass them through to the decision tree we then put these together into a pipeline. Oh, that was scrolling too much. Put these together into a pipeline, call fit on this. Then we predict the probability. And now the first important thing, as we've seen before, the data set is imbalanced. 
So that means we cannot use accuracy for assessing the quality. So that's why we opted for the area under curve score and use that now to estimate the, uh, the goodness of fit of the decision tree to the data. And we can see that we obtain an area under curve of 0.57, which if we recall pro uh, properties of area under curve, pretty bad because 0.5 is um, pure random, while 1.0 is um, perfect fit. Now let's, after that is more close to random than to perfect, let's, let's have a look at another model that is commonly used in machine learning examples, which is a support, um, a support vector machine. Uh, in contrast to the example above, we have put here the hyperparameters of the support vector machine as well, so that you basically see how much you can tune there in order to get the best performance. Also, the uh, support vector machine requires different preprocessing. Instead of the ordinal encoder, we now need to use a one-hot encoder, which replaces each categorical feature by uh, individual features, one for each category, which is then put to one if that category is active for that attribute, or zero otherwise. Um, also, this time, we need to treat the numerical data in order for the support vector machine to work. And we use a standard scaler, which um, which scales the data to have zero mean unit variance. Again, we put this into um, a pipeline. We call fit on this pipeline, and we again compute the area under curve. This time, it is 0.79, so that is quite an improvement. But um, as you might have seen, there there were quite some quite some steps to get there. Uh, you need to know which how to transform the data, you need to do it, and then fit them up. Um, the next, the formal model I'd like to look at now, which is the model that is currently most important, it is gradient boosting, gradient boosting classifier. Um, it has even more hyperparameters that you can set and change. But um, as it is based on trees, we can use the same encoding as we did for the decision tree, namely an ordinal encoder. We again put the whole thing into a pipeline call the fit function, again, predict the probabilities, compute the area on the curve, and obtain a slightly improved performance. So we've now seen three different um, machine learning models um, applied to the same data set, but you now need to um, actually know which ones can I use, what are the hyperparameters of that, how do I, the pre how do, I do the pre-processing in order to obtain such performance. And as we said before, we would like to do automated or machine learning in four lines of code. So let's now actually get to that and see what AutoSDR 1.0 can do for us. So again, we import, and that's the first thing. Then we construct the classifier, we call fit, we call predict, and that's it. There are, um, contrast to earlier, there are a few arguments to the classifier. But these are um, mostly problem specific. So um, the default limit would be one hour. We didn't want to wait that long. So if you would like to on download the notebook, you don't have to wait for an hour to do this. Um, but it actually runs in 10 minutes. We put in a seed so that it's reproducible. Um, because the data set is rather small, we decided to use a cross validation set of foldout. And this here, the area under curve, we need to let the model know, or we need to let the AutumnL tool know that we want to optimize for area under curve so that we get good performance with respect to the metric we're interested in. And, and that's it. It does all the machine learning for us. It does all the pre-processing for us. It directly ingests the data frame as it is. And if we look at the uh, score, it is now better than any of the three models that we had above which is pretty nice like because we, we didn't really do anything. We just imported a tool, called it, and waited 10 minutes, and then we got the results. So to show you now a bit what it did, let, let's have a look at what, the, what, the, what happened under the hood. So there's a function called sprint statistics. It gives us the data set name the metric that we optimized and the performance of the best model. 
Um, as you can see here, the performance is quite a bit lower than up here. So I'd say this, this is due to the ensemble that we constructed. In total, Auto Escalon constructed 44 models, or it tried to construct 44. It succeeded constructing 39. One fit crashed, most likely due to some numeric issues and cycle learn, but that actually doesn't matter to, to the overall process because auto SQLearn is robust to in, uh, algorithms failing. Um, three things exceeded a time limit. So that's another thing to get to robust. There's an internal time limit that makes sure that A, we finish on time after these 10 minutes, and B, no single algorithm call or no single model that we train can take all the time and and like, like, like eat up all the time that we have. And another thing is um, one model exceeded a memory limit. You also apply a memory limit on the target algorithms, on the machine learning algorithms, so that auto learn doesn't bring your system down in case it, it wants to do its matrix modifications. Um, we can next have a look at the models that were actually trained and selected. So these are the models that are in the ensemble. They are sorted by the cost. That is one minus the area under curve. We can see because the data set is so small, it took quite a little, bit of, it took very few, or very little time to actually fit the models. And we can see now that the model sorted by cost is, um, the first and best model is something called a passive aggressive classifier. The good thing is you don't really need to know now what this is. It is something in cycle learn, but you can read up later in case you haven't heard about it. Second most second best one is um, a QDA classifier, followed by a linear model trained with SGD, and only then we get the more uh, up-to-date gradient boosting. So in, in case you took a regular machine learning class, they I've never seen any which teaches about passive aggressive, so I probably wouldn't have chosen that for this data set. Um, yes, but what's also interesting is that not necessarily the best one gets the highest ensemble weight, but that actually the, um, the tool decides which of the models should get the highest weight based on how much it would contribute to your ensemble performance. And it turns actually out that this model here is very helpful overall, despite being not the best one by itself. Next, we can actually have a look at the individual models. This here is a list of tuples with um, first thing being the weight again, and the second thing being the actual pipeline with the hyperparameter setting that was run. These here are all the hyperparameters that are required for the pipeline. And if you, if you look closely in here, you can then see that there is a feature preprocessor being used that is called a kitchen sink. Um, so this basically means that we use um, that we use here an SVM approximation, an approximate SVM, um, which which was chosen by AutoSQLearn because actually it, it supposedly performs very well on this data set in combination with the other models. We can then use all this information to to learn about what's in the data set, how to best treat it, how to best handle it. And finally, for compatibility with Scikit-Learn, we also provide access to a um, field called CV results. That is how you would access the results with, uh, if you do have a parameter optimization with scikit-learn, so that our tool is really um, a plug-in or a plug-and-play replacement for a um, scikit-learn estimator. Yes. Now that, now that we've seen this, um, let's have a look at what we can do with them, what else we can do with the model. And we also want to demonstrate that we're really a um, plug, plug and play replacement. So we'll now have a look what um, what the inspection module of scikit-learn can do for us and what we can learn from it. And for this, we'll have a look at the par um, permutation importance score. So permutation importance is a way of variable importance. Uh, this tells us which, which feature of our data set was most important for the model. In this case, the auto SQL learn ensemble. And what it, what it does for each feature, it randomly shuffles the data, computes the performance, but also computes the performance without shuffling. And the difference is then basically how much worse are we if the information of that feature is removed. And if we get 
the performance degrades quite a lot. This feature obviously was important for the model. And with that, give me a second here, we learned that a feature called checking status was the most important one. It would not having that information would like reduce the area on the curve by 0.12. And we would end up with something around 0.68. So that's quite drastic. But while on the other hand, we know that a few features like job, age, or housing are not that important for the model. Yes, and you can use that with anything that works with scikit-learn. There's one caveat, maybe, that a lot of tools, unfortunately, cannot work with categorical features, such as, for example, the famous SHAP tool, or also scikit-learn's other uh, ways to, to figure out feature importance. But we have uploaded another tutorial about um, regression that only contains numerical features with um, the California housing data set. And we again have here, I'm, I'm briefly going over this, I'm not going over this in detail here. We again have the partial, um, the permutation importance plot. But here we also have the partial um, dependency plots. And we also demonstrate how to use um, the SHAP package to actually compute uh, Shapley values for this data set and feature imports via Shapley values. Yes, coming back here, I'd now like to uh, finish this demonstration by showing you how to go even more hands free with AutoSCLearn2. And as you can see here, um, I removed the cross validation. In fact, you cannot even specify cross validation as an argument anymore. Because as you learned before, this is automatically now decided by, by the AutumnL model itself. And all the arguments left here are how much, how long we want to wait, the seed for reproducibility, and the metric that we are interested in. And this now actually improves the performance even a bit further. And we get like two points of area on the curve over standard circular models by actually doing less by using an AutumnL. Uh, what we can now see as well in the leaderboard is we get quite some different models. We more get more tree models, um, get a few um, multi-layer perceptrons, aka neural networks, that, that are then used in this ensemble in the end. And now that you have this AutumnL tool that, that um, takes away the machinery part from you, you can focus on other things like getting more data doing feature engineering to um, improve over what scikit-learn offers you as feature engineering. Um, of course, it's also possible to um, customize auto SQL learn a bit more to your needs. If you go to our um, documentation websites, you'll find a lot of examples, starting from basic examples on how to do classification, regression, etc., over um, how to restrict to only use interpretable models, um, how to change metrics, how to do model explanation, as I just showed you. Um, and then also like changing the search strategy, running in parallel, doing random search, or um, changing um, the inners of base optimization. And finally, also how to like plug in your own models or replace models that we have currently in there. Yes. With that, let me go back to the slide deck. Yes, that was now a demo session. Uh, I'd like to point you to more material that we have. Uh, it's available on a website called AutumnL.org. There is, for example, a book on AutumnL, uh, which, which contains, which goes very, very much into details. Um, there's also a blog about work that the machine learning research group at the University of Freiburg does, uh, including um, also, a blog post about the AutoSQL Learn method and it has information about upcoming talks and events. If you're interested in AutumnL and are a student of machine learning and practitioner or researcher, there will also be an AutumnL Fall School uh, with hands on sessions, networking sessions, invited talks from experts, and so on. Yes, and with that, I'd like to close the presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. If you like AutoSQLearn, please leave us a star on GitHub. If you're using AutoSQLearn, please drop us an email. And with that, thanks again for uh, having us at Europython. Thanks for your attention. 
and we'd be happy to take your questions now. Okay, thank you so much. It's uh, mind blowing, <laughs> even though I'm not in the topic. It seems uh, fascinating, and uh, there is uh, quite a bunch of uh, questions. First, let's see. Uh, are the possibility to use reinforcement learning as an optimizer? What are the downsides of using uh, reinforcement reinforcement learning? Please. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, yes, it's possible. There are um, scientific works that use um, reinforcement learning as an optimizer. Um, I haven't seen any compelling evidence that they are better, but uh, it actually makes the, the optimization procedure more complicated. I would say. Okay. Then we have: Can auto scale learn detect overfitting on the data set? Well, would be great if it could, um, but it doesn't do that. But what we do instead is we are using ensembles and that fight again, a bit against overfitting. And we, of course, well, use cross-validation holdout to prevent overfitting. The next one, are there any known limitations to auto scale learn? Yeah, that, that, that obviously is uh, well, kind of a trick question, I guess, because yeah, I, I guess there are quite a lot of them still. It's, I, I think one of the biggest limitations is um, it only works for supervised classifications, so you need to have a target metric. Um, the other thing is basically the, the way that auto learn is built requires that there is um, a pipeline predefined and that, that is then basically searched through. So it will not discover any fancy new pipeline unless we specify it. On the other hand, I think that's also an advantage because it doesn't go crazy and try out stuff that most likely won't work, but it actually will give you good results in a decent amount of time. Okay. And the unfortunate thing, um, the limitation that was asked before, it won't detect overfitting, but none of the autumn out tools will detect overfitting. Perfect. Yeah, maybe also um, to add here, sorry, <laughs> maybe no, not no, a limitation, yeah. but a clarification. So Autos learn so far works only on, on tabular data. So that's what we focus on. It doesn't natively handle images, for example, or audio signals. You would need to transform these into tabular features. Okay. Uh, the next one is, can you use Auto is never natural language processing ML applications. You could if you transform it to a tabular feature, but um, I guess there are other tools for that. And the last one is can auto scale learn also use models that are not from scale learn, such as XG Pulse classifier? Uh, yes, it can. Um, we provide examples on how to extend auto to learn with other models. Um, they just won't be in the metadata, so you would have to run auto to learn a bit longer for them to actually have an effect. And the last one, where can we find the notebook? <laughs> yeah. I will uh, post the link in the chat. I guess that's the easiest. Perfect. OK, well, um, if people want to continue with the discussion, uh, you can go to the breakout uh, for the parrot and ask more questions there. Thank you so much to both of you, uh, Kat and Matt. Yes. Um, thanks yeah. for having us, and see you over in the breakout room. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay.